very interested to see what the city really plans to do around the building. Because you can't sell the building without the ground. So we have the mayor's And my minutes need to come up. She's telling people that she's actually... You know, I'm very opposed to it. Have you been? I'm good. You know, good summer? Yeah, everybody's busy. Yeah, very busy. I should take it to get a new house. Uh, <laughs> Besides, you and you and me do not want to do that much. I'm considering painting, gardening. I started painting recently. Congratulations. Yes, that, that Congratulations. wasn't that important. Cartooning. Right. Keep it clean. Well, I took time. I think I got over it. My tomatoes didn't start. Oh, I got a slow start. Well, they kind of stuck in the start. My neighbors are just beginning to move. Same with my pickles. Mostly my pickles got stuck. Potatoes. I got potatoes. Leeks. Rhubarb. Mm. Can't be hard to grow rhubarb. Rhubarb is like a weed almost. Yeah, exactly. Harvest the rhubarb before it goes to seed. Yeah, I mean, I haven't used any of it now. It's all sort of gone. The rhubarb, you know, you small noodles, still, you cut it chunks. Put it in a pan and just pour it. And it makes a nice sauce to go on the wall, I see. So if you want a rhubarb, I'll give you plenty. And you know, I love I probably still have rhubarb there. I don't want to taste it. You want some more? Okay, I'm up. No? I do. I haven't had time to do any major canning. Last year, I can't make great tomato sauce, canned tomato sauce. Why do you have a garden? <laughs> what? Just in case. Help a friend. That's all. Okay. We're going to start in just a moment. We're having computer problems. We're just trying to get online. So be a little patient for with this for a couple of minutes. Yeah, I can have Joe get him. He'll get him for us. I, I got to turn on the recorder thing. Today. Oh, do you? Oh, okay. That's my backup. backup, backup. Okay. Shame these things are so slow. <laughs> The meeting of the Human Services Committee for Wednesday, September 5th, 2012. Uh, we do have a quorum, so we'll call the meeting to order. Could we have approval of the minutes of the August 6th meeting? Move to approve. Second. It's been, it's been moved and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 
First item on the agenda tonight uh, for discussion, it's a review of the police complaints. And um, those would be the ones that we have, um, that you received in your packet. Um, but we have a number of citizens that have signed up uh, under police complaints. So if we would like to address those people first, to have them speak, uh, I will call on um, the items um, that you have signed up to speak for um, just right before we get to that item. So they will have the uh, citizens speak before um, we discuss it. So uh, we have uh, Ms. Greenwall, Greenwell, Mr. Greenwell. Uh, we have Miss Esther. No, I'm sorry, Miss Esther is open. We have. Um, wow, can you read that? We have Miss. This one right here. Uh, it's at 1220 Daryl. That's the address. I can, oh, sorry. I'm That's sorry, Dakel. I'm sorry. I couldn't read the writing, Miss Fonda and. Um, Ms. Wesson and Reverend Walker. If you'll come up in that order right to this microphone. Thank you. And would you state your name and your address, please? Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ava Thompson Greenwell. I live at 1625 Kirk Street in Evanston. At approximately 11.30 a.m. on Thursday, August 30th, I was sitting in my backyard when I heard some loud male voices. I opened the east side gate to see two white plainclothed police officers. One was handcuffing my 13-year-old son. My son's bike was on the ground. The officers never identified themselves. They did not ask my son his age or where he lived. And as he was about to put his bike in his own backyard, they ambushed him from behind in our driveway without asking any questions. Only commands. Put your hands up, they said, and they handcuffed him. I asked, what was happening here? What are you doing? The handcuffing officer said a burglary had occurred nearby and that my son fit the description. I asked, what was the description? And I was told, a black male wearing cargo shorts. They then paraded our handcuffed son to the front of our home. Why are you doing this, I asked. Why do you need to handcuff him? This seemed like racial profiling, I told them. To which one officer responded, come on, don't give me that. This is not racial, a racial incident. You would want us to arrest the person who broke into your house. Why did they need to take him to the front of the house where neighbors and passersby might see him and assume he's guilty of some crime? The only response I got was that he needed to be handcuffed because he might flee. By the time we walked to the front of the house, there were at least three other armed police officers in plain view and about five cop cars. I don't think a 13-year-old law-abiding teen would flee with his mother standing beside him and at least five armed police officers. As I tried to get close to my son, one officer told me, step back away from your son without any explanation. I asked why couldn't they question him on the side of the house where he would, be, would not be on display for public ridicule and humiliation. No one ever responded to my inquiry. Unbeknownst to me, police drove over the alleged burglary victim for what's called a show up, where she indicated our son was not the person. My son was uncuffed and retreated inside our home, angry and in tears over being handled with such disrespect and denigration. Quickly, most of the officers disappeared, not immediately offering an apology until I demanded one. You owe my son an apology, I said, to which the offending officer responded in the following tone. That's what I was going to do, but he ran inside. I then brought my son back to the front so he could receive the apology, which was insincere at best and condescending at worst. The officer didn't even look us in the eye. In addition, the officer told me he used to live in the projects in Chicago. I failed to understand how that piece of information was relevant to the situation at hand. Since when do police officers handcuff a minor without asking any questions first, without asking if a parent is home, their age, their name, where they live? The fact that this happened with a parent in plain sight on my own property ought to make all of us concerned. It was cuff first, ask questions later. I still can't believe that Evanston would treat its taxpaying citizens with such disdain. 
I've lived in the Evanston community since 1993. To have an alleged victim show up in front of my house to identify my detained son is unconscionable. It was unnecessary. It was unfair. It was un-American. Evanston police have traumatized my entire family. Clearly, Evanston police procedures need examination and change is necessary. Why didn't the dispatcher ask more questions? to get a more detailed description of the alleged offender. Why couldn't the officer have politely asked my son how old he was, if he lived on the property, and questioned him with me present? There was no need to handcuff him. We can't fight crime in Evanston by turning innocent citizens into criminals. If Evanston truly values all of its citizens, the answers to these questions must come quickly. To do anything less, would be an injustice, not just to our family, but to all families in Evanston. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak about this important issue. Uh, there's not much that I can add to the details of what Ava just mentioned. However, I, do, I want to tell you about my, my son. He's the type of son that all parents dream of having. He has not given Ava or myself any trouble in, in the 13 years we've had the privilege of being his parents. As I think about that day, a lot of what ifs go through my mind. What if he got really scared and started to run? What if his mother had not been there? What if he had reached for his cell phone? What if the victim had identified him as being, a, being the robber? What if I was there and not my wife? This incident could have been a lot worse. Thank God it wasn't, but these questions have to be asked. What occurred on August 30th is a black parent's worst nightmare. The young man that the police handcuffed is an honor roll student at Chute Middle School and is entering the eighth grade. He has won high flying Eagle Awards in his sixth and seventh grade year at Chute. Last year, our own Mayor Tisdale attended one of the ceremonies. During his years at Chute, his teachers or his principal has never contacted us about an incident involving him. He plays the saxophone in the jazz and concert band at Shoot. He's involved in numerous activities uh, at school and after school. He's currently taking honors math. He was recently selected to a prestigious writing camp at UIC in which only 15 boys were selected from 100 entries. He plays on the Shoot basketball team and is also active in FAM, AAU, and numerous sports camps in the Chicagoland area. Since kindergarten, he, had, he was in the two-way immersion TWEE program in District 65 and now speaks fluent Spanish. He's one of the nicest young men you will ever meet. However, on that August 30th date, he was treated like a common criminal. He's not, a perf he's not perfect and still has to be reminded from time to time to do his chores and homework, <clears throat> but he's never embarrassed himself or his family. Even though he was victim, victimized, I will not allow him to go down the path of being a chronic victim. The reason is that he was innocent, and the only thing he was guilty of was riding his bicycle home. He was very cooperative to the police officers during the whole ordeal. In fact, he would have even, <clears throat> within reason, helped the victim and the police officer apprehend the, the robber. That's the kind of young man he is. Maybe the police officer on that day should have taken notes on, from him on how to treat others with dignity and respect. This open season on young black boys has to end. Is it, is it any wonder why these young boys grow up to distrust all police officers? These officers have taken an oath to protect and serve. As a taxpaying citizen for 20 years, I don't expect anything less. After last Thursday, I'm starting to have buyer's remorse. I don't know how this incident will impact him down the road, but one thing I do know is that he'll always have his dad and his moms in his corner. Right. I'm DeKel Fonda, and 
Um, I'm here because when I read the report about what happened to the family that just spoke to you, um, it really hit close to home. I have a 26-year-old son. He's a college grad at this point, um, and, and he's a young man of color, uh, African-American and, and Caucasian. And this was, the, this was so close. I, I would love to be able to share some of the experiences that he had in Evanston. I don't have his permission to do that, but I can tell you that... I, it, it was only too familiar and too common for him and many of his friends. And there were some incidents that were totally humiliating to him. He knew exactly what to do um, when he was stopped. And it became a particular problem when he started driving um, when he was a junior in high school. So I'm here to just, to, to first of all, support this family um, and to tell you what I think a lot of people, particularly in the community of color in Evanston, would tell you um, among the African-American community as well as the interracial community and the Latino community, that these are experiences that their children have had too frequently. I serve on the police advisory board because I believe that this can, this can change, but I don't see it changing quickly enough. And I think that I know we have a citizen advisory board, and I, and I think the council has oversight of that, and I would like to know um, what, what, what the council is doing in terms of oversight. And I also think we need to begin to look at some serious change in the training of the police officers. We have a lot of new police officers who do not know our children, and they don't live here. They probably can't afford to, but they, they don't know them. So I'm here to support the family, but, but also to say that this is, more, this is a systemic problem. This is not an individual individual, just one individual case. This was particularly um, uh, offensive and, and problematic, but it's happened to many families in Evanston. Thanks. Good evening. I'm uh, Reverend Walker. Um, I didn't plan on speaking per se, but I did come because my son uh, had a similar incident uh, only about a week prior to yours. And he's 28 years old. Um, today he's at work right now. And, and uh, um, when I mentioned to him about the meeting, he said, well, Dad, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. And um, his mindset about it is that uh, he understands um, the officers have a, a job to do. But um, just as I have raised him, there are ways that you can do your duties. Um, we understand that you have a sense of duty, but then there also should be common sense. Um, there should be a professional sense in how you deal with things as well as a community, uh, sense of community. Um, I'm sure that they spend many of their hours, more hours in the community than they do in their own homes, uh, just because it just makes common sense. Uh, 60, uh, 40 to 60 hours on, at work and just 40 hours of sleep. Uh, the rest, you know, not much at all at home. So um, it would behoove them to take the time uh, to uh, learn the people and to be a part of the community that they really are a part of. Um, it would do them best. Um, some of the things that they mentioned here um, shows that they didn't have uh, professionalism about them. Uh, once they did stop my son, and from what I read about the incident, um, that the person they were looking for is about five six. At, at first, that's what that what, that's what he was told. My son is about six eight, so he's far from five six. So there's not a sense of awareness, obviously. Um, and then what I heard that the young man that they were looking for with them, them they said was a shorter guy. So um, something's wrong with that picture. And he said once they grabbed him. And, uh, um, and he, he, he was walking home, he was wearing all black. So, so when they grabbed him, they said, um, you know, and they, made, and they said they, after they let him go, they said, sorry, bro, we didn't mean to F with you, you know? And I don't know which job or any organization that I've ever belonged to that you would use that kind of language uh, with your customer. Uh, we are the customers of, of Evanston community. Um, they are here to serve and protect us, and we, we look to them for that purpose. Uh, we want to help them. Uh, we make phone calls regularly if we see something that's out of sync in our neighborhood. So we expect them to, to live up to that, um, that, that, that uh, contract, you know, that, that, that relationship and that's not happening, and it's unfortunate. And, and, and we're aware that young, young individuals who come into uh, an, an 
an organization has a lot to learn. And so it's up to the whole community to work towards that to make that better. You know, um, it's obvious that they don't have it. And when he called the watch commanders, um, he didn't receive, which I was privy to hearing at that time, uh, he didn't receive a very good response. In fact, they told him, how did you get our number? You know, uh, why are you calling here? And, you know, he's very internet savvy. You know, he said, well, you know, I got your number. And then they hung up on him. So then he called the, um, um, he, we, I called our alderman, and then we were able to uh, talk to the uh, chief of police. Um, and so he felt good that he got that information out. But, you know, as a young man, um, I know they did not leave a good impact on him. Um, but because he's more mature, he just realized, hey, at least it got the information is out there. And, and then hopefully something can be done. So um, I, I, you know, plead to your sense of, of, of judgment and, and sense of understanding that uh, something does need to happen. Um, those young men need to understand uh, the, the impact that their job is making, uh, not only on themselves, but on others around them. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wesson. Marianne, you want to speak on this? Um, my name is Marianne Weston, and I live in Evanston. I have, in fact, since 1973. Um, like Ava and Dale Greenwell, I pay taxes. Uh, I have two sons, um, and they went through the Evanston schools. They were never stopped by police for nothing at all. Is that because we live in Alderman Tendam's ward in Northwest Evanston? Is it because they're white? Um, I understand police have jobs to do, but I also understand that those jobs can be done well or they can be done poorly. And I understand that it is quite possible to educate um, officers to be sensitive to the people that they are serving, as uh, has been brought up before. And I think it's worthy of Evanston to do that. Um, they, we are a unique community, and if we cannot educate and train and select our police officers to <coughs> understand what we are and who we are as a community and not to um, do things like happened to um, Ava and Dale's son, uh, then we are not solving the crime problem and we are not uh, being the sort of community that I think a great number of us live in Evanston to be. So I would really uh, ask and request uh, that some sort of study investigation be undertaken into what sort of training police officers have, how often they are required to uh, renew this training, and how sensitive the police are and how responsive they are to uh, concerns and complaints from their constituents, from the citizens of Evanston. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> for those of you, for those of you who signed up, open. Um, do you want to speak on this issue, I, um, Mr. Cree, Mr. Cree, and Ms. Esther? No, I wasn't signing up to speak on that issue, but it was about the police uh, reporting everything. On the 18th of August, the Citizen Network Protection, we had a meeting and we invited the resident of the community, the whole community. And what we had at that meeting was, it was an educational meeting. And the person we had there was from the Office of Professional Standard, the officer that investigate the complaints. And when we heard this, we said, gee, we just was talking about this issue. 
and stuff. So we are doing something in um, the farm, talk about the advisory committee. Yes, we know about those committee and we've been talking with the chief and everything. And one thing that the group has been pushing and constantly and still push, that we need to have an independent advisory review committee of the police. Most of this, the communities here in the United States have gone that way because you are, it's that sad to say, they always say, well, you're having the fox guard the hen house. Well, we know what happened when you do that. But the issue that what happened to her son was unfortunate. We was there. We was talking about things that need to change. We have talked to the chief about issues where we talked about they need to be training and everything. We, the Citizens Network of Protection meet the third Tuesday of every month, and those that wish to join us to help us create the Independent Citizen Review Board, we would love to have you. And the things that we did with the Office of Professional Standard, the staff person that came, we will be having her back because there was so many discussion and questions and things that we did not get through that presentation. But her presentation, then the question dealt with the issues that this family is facing. So we will be having her back to continue that. And I encourage people to come and to talk. And people ask, and we always ask this question, well, why come people are not coming to our meeting? And there was different suggestions and stuff. And one person said, well, it might be because it's in the fifth ward, and people think that this is just happening to people in the fifth ward. Yes, the fifth ward is predominantly black, but Evanston has black citizens all over. It's unfortunate it happened to them, but when we have something in the fifth ward, we have it there because we don't have to spend any money out of our pocket, so this is the group that is doing this. We don't have a budget, we don't have fun, and the facility is open to us. It is a community center for anyone in Evanston to come to. So I encourage you to come. I encourage you to, and I know that her complaint that she filed will go through the proper steps. Hopefully it will not take the full three months, six months to do complete the investigation as the staff person kind of alluded to. So we hope that it will go through the process with the utmost urgency. Thank you. My name is Madeline Dupree. I'm a resident of Everston, Fifth Ward. Uh, I was going to speak on a few things tonight, but uh, a lot of this uh, I'm hearing tonight is bringing back memories, and it just didn't start last week and week before last. I have six children, four of them are boys, or had four boys, and um, <laughs> listening, it almost brought tears to me. Uh, to my eyes, and I'm shaking because it's like a replay. These things have been happening since the 70s. My children came up, my grandchildren, my brother before that, and I and a lot of other people have been involved in this type of thing that's happening. But sometimes people do not understand how this affects children lives later on and I want to tell you from a parent point of view it is not nice it's not good because my children 13 14 years old they used to come and complain to me 
things are happening out here. The police are harassing me. And I, of course, you know, no, that's not happening. Then again, maybe it can happen. But you have to be on your best behavior, blah, 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 blah. Walk a, you know, walk a tight rope. And I'm saying to myself, why should I tell my children that? They are just like anybody else, any other child out there, any other young man out there. To make a long story short, I started telling them, hey, you stand up for your rights, you speak up for your rights, but with respect. Did it happen? Did it change things? No. One son, number three son, he's been going through hell, okay? Sheer hell since he was 13, 14 years old. And maybe I made mistakes, okay? But I'm not taking the blame for everything that my children have done that this system has helped to create from District 65, from the schools, all the way through. And they are still going through something because they have a record. And I keep trying to preach to people. Records keep you down, too. But let me tell you one thing that is really touching my heart more so. My 16, 17-year-old grandson, who happened to be the child, the father, child of the th second, third son, he went through a similar thing. The boy played basketball. He was an honor student. Smiled, played. And if someone think about it, they know who, which one I'm talking about. And it hurt him so bad because he was at the park, which I was going to speak about, the basketball court that they used to play at Red Fence. This young man went there, and Alderman Dolores, the chief, also know what happened, because we went. I tried my best to follow through on things. They were playing basketball. It was about six or seven young men there. Every last one of those six or seven young men who went through that either did have a record or they're going through sheer hell, hell already and still, okay? My grandson could have gone another way. And I hope and pray that you get some counseling for your child. I really don't care if you are a professor at wherever. I really don't care. Because guess what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay? If you don't get some help, just talking, because you don't know how these children are traumatized by this. They will react in different ways. Some of them hold it in, some of them let it out. And Lord help you either way. Okay? But this young man that I'm saying, he made a U-turn. And we're still trying to help him. Okay? Anyway, I'm, thank you. This is all I have to say right now. There are two other people. <clears throat> Sorry, there are two other people. Uh, Muslims, are you, did you want to speak on this issue? Yes, yes. yes okay. Um, Jermaine and Jackie. Hi, my name is Jermaine Newsom, and we're residents of Evanston. And this is my daughter Jacqueline Newsom. We had a similar incident to the Greenwells that happened to our daughter Patrice. She's now down at Clemson University. This was in 08. There was an incident regarding an assault on a young woman, and the police were driving around, and they gave the same excuse that they gave to the Green Wells about if something had happened to one of your children, you would want us to do the same. No, I wouldn't. I was not there when the police came. I have the um, recounting from my daughter, but Jacqueline was there before we arrived, and she could tell you a little bit more about it. In the end, we did have an open discussion with the police and the chief of police and everyone involved and the officers as well, and they did apologize. They did apologize. The apology was a little, and it was late, but they did apologize. But the incident was just unbelievable what they did and unnecessary, totally unnecessary. Of course, the victim indicated that they were not the people that assaulted her and the police wanted to <coughs> let them go and to just drop it. We pushed it a bit further. But Jacqueline can recant more of the incident than I can. 
Um, my name is Jacqueline Newsom. I've been a resident of Evanston since 1990. I graduated from Evanston Township High School. I went to Shoot Middle School and Dawes Elementary School. I graduated from New York University in May, and I'll be attending the University of Chicago Law School in the fall. And I find it important to announce all those things so that you all think I'm credible enough to speak to you, and so that you all invest in what I'm about to tell you about this incident with my sister, who goes to the number three school for food science in the country. Um, she was 16 years old. She was with her friend. They were walking up into our uh, home to enter into the side door. The police drove over with the sirens on, made sure they embarrassed my sister and her friend in front of all of our neighbors, called everyone outside. It seemed like there was a uh, surrounding around them. The police indicated that they needed to get into the car. My sister was, of course, hesitant. These were two male white police officers, and she was 16 by herself. I was the only person at home. They told her that if she didn't get into the car, they were going to arrest her. They began to swear at her and her friend, and they ended up getting into the car. When I got to the police station, I was 17 years old at the time. The police refused to speak to me because I was 17, and so we had to get her friend's mother to come in and to handle the situation. Um, to give you all comparative analysis, I was in 2010 in a vehicle with a young white male in front of my house at 12 o'clock at night. The police came to stop us because there had been a car burglary and the situation was totally different. They explained everything to the young man who was in the driver's seat. They asked him politely to see his ID and they left us alone. There was no lingering, there was no confrontation, there was no anger and apologies for wasting our time. So there is a clear distinction about how these students are being treated um, and I would these incidents, even though what happened to my sister did not directly happen to me, have caused me to be afraid of the Evanston police. And I'm going to school to be an attorney to do criminal litigation. And I fear the Evanston police. I fear being out after 8 o'clock at night in my car because I'm afraid of what may happen to me or my friends in this town. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, those were the last speakers um, on this particular incident. And now on our agenda is the um, review of the police complaints. But before that, I just want to simply say, for addressing something that uh, <coughs> Ms. Fonda mentioned, um, we do have a process uh, in terms of reviewing the police complaints. Um, this has certainly um, uh, expanded uh, since I've been on the council, and this is my seventh year. Um, um, we hear all of, or we receive all of the complaints that the police department have. They come in as they are reviewed by the citizens uh, committee. There are two committees um, uh, that the um, chief has that he uses uh, for advice, and then they, they make decisions, and then we get those, and we look at them, and sometimes we have questions, sometimes we don't. You know, it all depends. So this, your situation, uh, since it has been filed, we'll go through that same uh, process. So we do not have that information before us tonight, but we wanted to, you know, allow you to speak. And uh, what, what I'm going to do is ask the chief if he could tell us how long it will be before this comes, or approximately, I mean, you can't say exact, so that then you will come back when we are going to hear and see the evidence, okay? Uh, good evening, Madam Chairman. Uh, I anticipate this will take no longer than 45 to 60 days. Uh, one of the drivers in that is obviously the uh, the Greenwells were unhappy with the police service ha are available to us and have been interviewed by uh, Sergeant Hart's glass. If we have follow-up questions, I'm certain they'll be available f to us to get those answered so that we'll fast track it and uh, we'll, we should be back in uh, relatively short order with, with this particular complaint based on that uh, cooperation. Thank you. Um, so I just want to say to um, the Greenwells that um, we will certainly, you know, you will know when we have this before us uh, on our agenda. And we have the police complaints on the Human Services agenda each and every month that we meet. But if he's saying from 45 to 60 days, okay? Will somebody contact us? Uh, yes, that will be through the police department. Um, Officer Hardglass is back there in the back, and she will certainly let you know. Okay, but also you can check our website too. And well, it won't be on there. You won't um, you won't see it. But we will make sure that you know when we're going to have it. I'll promise you that. Okay. 
uh, Alderman Grover and then Alderman Bethley. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Reverend Walker? Can you come to the mic? I'm sorry. Uh, we asked you to come to the mic only because it's being televised so that people can see you. I have a question. The complaint that my son made, was it official or wasn't it? I mean, he, he actually talked to the chief of police. I would expect that that complaint would have been an official complaint. It, I'm pretty sure it was. Um, he did file. A, he did file, if I remember correctly. He did file a complaint as well, and, and then I had him speak with the chief because of some other issues that I wanted him to discuss with the chief. Yeah. Um, uh, Madam Chairman, I don't recall off the top of my head. I will produce that information and share it with the Reverend and the committee so they have an answer to that. One of the issues that quite frankly occurs when, when we have these discussions is there, there's a decision point for the, the people involved whether or not they want to pursue it. And, and I, I don't recall off the top of my head when we got that the decision point at what it was, but I will share that with the Reverend and the committee uh, after we get it out of the OPS files. Fantastic. He okay. wanted to pursue it. He was pretty upset. And he gave his name officially, Brooks Walker. So mm -hmm. you remember. Okay. It wasn't just a off the cuff calling no. somebody just to be called. No, I know he I do know that he did go he told me he went to the police department. He wasn't really satisfied and then that's when I was ill, so that's what I asked him to call the chief and talk speak with the chief. I understand. I just mm -hmm. think that when you call some place officially, if you call my job officially and I was um, a supervisor or someone in charge and you left the message or information like that with me, it would be official. It would be written down and would be put in the books. I would not think that it would just be something that you just spoke to my ears and that would be it. Absolutely. And, and so well, that's, we, that seems to be what I'm hearing now. No, no, no. Well, I'm not sure. So let, let's check it out first, okay. and we'll make sure. Thank and you. I will get back with you on that. Alderman Grover and then Alderman Brathwaite. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Greenwell, for coming tonight and uh, filling us in on this incident. Um, I apologize. I'm sorry for what happened to your son. And I can say that I think I understand how an incident like this would have repercussions of a different dimension for your upstanding exemplary 13-year-old son than it would for my upstanding exemplary 12-year-old son. So. I look forward to and hope that you will join us for the discussion when the Citizens Advisory Committee produces a report for this committee to deliberate, and I hope you'll be part of that discussion. Um, I think I want to thank you for f requesting an investigation of the report so that we can have that discussion mm -hmm. once we have all the information as part of this formal report. So thank you very much, and um, I wish your son a really good school year altogether. So, so thank you. And apologies. Okay. Thank you. Alan Bethwaite. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I first uh, want to thank all the residents who, who took the time to, to be here this evening. Um, it's difficult to sit here with a straight face and, and not be emotional when you hear stories like this, particularly as a parent uh, with two black boys as well. So I hear you. And I think it's important that you understand that we hear what you're saying. Um, I also want to offer an apology um, for your experience and, and for the experience of those that, that took the time to be here. Um, they may seem like empty words, but for, for all of us who sit up here, we're all concerned. And I trust the chief of police, and I don't have a problem saying that. And I'm sure that at the end of the investigation that we will get the answers that you seek. I also want to encourage you to meet with Chief Eddington and bring your son and have that face-to-face -face conversation just to start that healing process. And, he, and he's very effective in those meetings, and I've sat through a few of them. So I hope that after this meeting that you exchange numbers and, and take the time to, to meet with him as we are going through this process and investigate uh, what exactly happened on that particular day. Um, the other thing that I want to encourage you to do, and, and many of the people that, that spoke earlier, I saw their, pace, their faces, there is a, a, a series of dialogues that, that are going on in Evanston right now uh, that are dealing with, with, with this big issue of race that we seem to pretend is not an issue here in, in town. 
and I would encourage you to to come out and, and participate in that conversation. Uh, Alvin Holmes, can you tell me what the next date? October, I want to say October 25th. Let me see if I have it on my calendar. Yeah. Uh, it will be the next one here, I believe. One second, if I can pull it up. Uh, is that what you have it? I believe October 20th. October 25th at 7 o'clock in the parasol room. parasol room, which is on the fourth floor. It will be the second of a series of three yeah. that we're doing citywide. But in, a, in addition to that, there are, in addition to that, there are other meetings that are happening like at the y, uh, WCA, because race is an issue in this community. We know that, and um, we're really trying. Um, Mayor Tisdall has this committee, and we've been working on it um, for over almost a year, really try and just pull it together to get people in the same room so we can begin to talk about it because it's bigger than just the police department in that um, and I think that we're all conscious of it and and, I, and certainly Alderman Grover and Alderman Breathway speaks for us all in terms of an apology but it's more than that's needed and I know that been working on this for a long time we've made some progress but there's a long way to go. The issues of officers maybe not knowing our our kids, and that means not knowing us, not knowing our community, yeah. is a big part of it. And uh, some of it has to do with whether they live here or not, and there's dialogue back and forth about that. So there's a lot to the um, a lot to this particular issue, um, but one that I think all of us are sensitive to yeah. and certainly um, want to address and I, I too would have to say that our chief has been very sensitive to that and since he's been here uh, I know that there have been some changes um, within the department and certainly within the approach and um, so we'll continue to work on it and um, we certainly want to make sure that all of our children in this community are safe. So there should be no difference in terms of that. And certainly there's a lot of difference between a five foot six person and a six foot seven. So just being conscious to look at, you know, that kind of change. And, you know, there's a lot of black boys walking with cargo shorts on. So, you know, so it could certainly be, there had to be a T or something that could have distinguished that. So, you know, that's training, and I'm sure the chief is going to address that. Okay. So, and I guess there was one other announcement, and that's Peaceable Cities. We have mm -hmm. a walk this on Sunday. Sunday. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's another opportunity just to, again, you are bringing awareness to an issue that has been going on for years. And it's just a shame when those voices are silent. So I encourage you to come out and participate and encourage others as well. And uh, again, I'm, I'm confident by working with the Chief of Police as well as when we get to see the report in the committee, I, I pray that we get the answers that you're looking for. So thank you again for your presence here tonight. Thank you. Um, now, to the police complaints that are on our agenda. And I made the point of saying that we get them all. And um, I don't know, does anybody have any questions or comments on this month? Because I certainly wanted to comment on, on CR 11-13, which <laughs> was a, com I just have to say this, but it was a complete waste of time in terms of, I read it over and over again because I couldn't believe it. Um, and I, I'm saying that because sometimes this kind of issue, we must have another kind of solution that could uh, address an issue like this, that that much time and dollars and staff resources went into looking for a wave cap, two wave caps, I'm sorry, not one, but two. I, that I just find absolutely, um, don't we have a contingency fund or something, Chief, where they could have just bought two wave caps and given them to him? I, and Holmes, do you mind just sharing a little bit I'm of background sorry. about that for those that are present? <laughs> well, yes, I'm, I'm sorry. It's uh, uh, good evening again, uh, Madam Chairman. Um, this um, is a little more complex than it seems. Um, and, and I realize the expense involved in replacing the caps would have been a, a fantastic savings over uh, the investigation that ensued. Uh, unfortunately, the, the the actual complaint the individual was alleging was that we had retained these uh, items to plant at a crime scene later. 
that that was the gist of this issue. And so uh, th that was his expressed concern to the OPS sergeant, and that's why we diligently work through this situation and uh, I realize that doesn't come through clearly in the verbiage but that was the motivation of the individual that filed the complaint. All right. And just for the audience, we get every complaint <laughs> so it doesn't matter and I, I can't even add up the dollars that went into a staff time in terms of looking for two wave caps. And for those of you who don't know what a wave cap is, it's just like a hairnet kind of thing. Uh, so <laughs> I just thought it was, and it was completely unfounded by the uh, both of the um, citizens' committees as well as the uh, as the uh, officer in charge. So that was what I was referring to. Okay. Any other questions or comments? No. No. Then can we have a motion to accept the uh, move to accept the uh, report of September fifth? Citizens <coughs> for the um, for, police department and citizens complaint review. Second. Okay, it's been moved and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Uh, the second item um, this evening is the approval of the request for a proposed um, management audit for the Evanston Township. And um, we have only um, uh, the assessor wanted to speak to the group. So you want us to do that first, Ms. Wilson? Oh, I'm sorry, the bills. Okay, I'll do the bills. I'm sorry, Ms. Yes. Let me do let me do the assessor first and then we'll do the bills. Thank you, um, Trustee Holmes and everyone for letting me speak tonight. Um, I'm actually very emotional about what they said, so I, I'll try to calm down because they really got to me. Um, I just want to give everyone an update on the Evanston, I'm Bonnie Wilson, Evanston Township Assessor, and I just wanted to give everyone an update on, uh, on what we have done in the Assessor's Office for the last uh, five months, actually. Um, the 2012 Evanston Appeal Session at the Cook County Board of Review ended yesterday. My office assisted 232 taxpayers in filing their appeals. 2012 appeal result letters should be sent to taxpayers in approximately eight to ten weeks if they were get an answer whether their appeal was accepted or not or um, denied. I would like to remind all Evanston property owners that 2013 is a triannual reassessment year. The mailing of the new assessment notices should take place in the February of 2013. The new values takes effect in the 2013 second installment which is payable in 2014. However, the time to appeal the new assessments is immediately after receiving the assessment notice from the Cook County Assessor. 2013 reductions in an assessment do not guarantee a property tax decrease. I want to emphasize that. I urge everyone to appeal their 2013 assessments both to the Cook County Assessor initial, initially and then to the Cook County Board of Review next summer to ensure a fair and uniform assessment for everyone. Since the last Human Services Committee meeting on August 6th, my office helped 19 taxpayers with certificate of errors for missed exemptions, totaling $27,227. The total amount of exemptions corrections for the first five months of the township fiscal year was $298,555. $100, and that is um, just for exemptions. It doesn't have to do with appeals. It just has to do with their exemptions, and I want to emphasize again, if anybody felt that they did not get the exemptions that they were entitled to, homeowners, senior, senior freeze, you can still apply for homeowners and all those exemptions and call our office at 847-332-2465. We are open from um, 8.30 to 4.30, and we are in the corner of Maine and Dodge, 846 Dodge. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And then, I'm sorry, we, uh, I missed, uh, I passed over the township bills for the month of August. Is there a motion for approval? Move to approve. Is there a second? Are there any questions? It's been moved and seconded. Are there any questions on the bills this month? 
I don't know if Alderman Breathwaite had any. I didn't have any. Um, no? Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, then H2 is the approval to issue the request for a proposal for an RFP for a comprehensive management audit of the Evanston Township. Is there a, um, okay, uh, are there, Second. it's been moved and second. Are there questions? Um, it's in your packet. Uh, and the table of contents covers the introduction, the scope of service, the proposed timeline, the initial assessment and the roadmap, the directions for submission, reservations of rights, the evaluation criteria, and the submission deadline. So those are the eight items uh, that would be involved in the RFP. Alderman Grover. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to make the point that uh, the funding for this operational audit would come out of the township's budget for 2013, not 2012. Uh, so I'm assuming that we would um, secure the services of the operational auditor and then the bill would be paid in 2013 as part of the next budget. Although I don't think the, for the township budget, that's what the memo says, the township, township. budget. No. no? Um, to, City manager. Or am I drawing the wrong conclusion? Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, the township is in their budget year, so. For 2013? Um, they have a 2012 2013 budget. Their, right. their year is not a, a calendar year budget. So I, I think we would, we would come back uh, to the council. We would, we would ask that the township board hold a special meeting. Um, in order to approve the uh, contract with the, with the firm that would be recommended. So I think, Mr. Swinkowski, we're hoping to do that sometime the latter part of October, if all goes well, um, if not the first part of November, and then the, likely the engagement would start either at the very first of December or right at the first of the year. Um, so at that rate, then it would be the 2012 budget? Well, because it, their township budget doesn't enter until March, is that right? 2012, 2013. Yeah. Okay. So the, yeah. there, there shouldn't be any budget okay. year issues oh, with the okay. township. We'll, we'll work with the assessor uh, and, the, and the supervisor on when we have a dollar amount to sort through how that will impact their budget. And if we need to come back to the township board with a budget amendment, uh, we'll do that. But until we know, um, I think as has been alluded to in Mr. Swinkowski's uh, staff report, uh, it's very difficult to know what the final number would be. I think we have a sense of what it should be. Um, but I'll tell you, uh, another hat I wear is treasurer of the Northwest Municipal Conference, and they recently did a, a similar RFP for a strategic planning process and got proposals that far exceeded uh, what was estimated. So I just add that as a caveat. We'll be careful to go through the responses, work with the proposers, and uh, this would be a negotiated um, a proposal that we'd ultimately bring back to you to make sure that we're getting our money's worth. But uh, uh, this is a difficult kind of proposal as we've gone through looking for firms, uh, trying to get a sense of who might do this. Uh, there aren't a lot of firms in Illinois. There's probably not a lot of firms around the country um, that would have an expertise to do uh, an understanding of the Illinois township system. So uh, I'll add that just as a cautionary note. Uh, we're going into this with our eyes wide open and want to make sure uh, that whatever we bring to you ultimately is is worthwhile and, and meaningful, uh, not only for the, the assessor and the, uh, the supervisor, but also for the township board and for the staff of the township. Right. Thank you, um, city manager. Okay, it's been moved and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, any opposed? Okay, moving on to H3. The American, did I skip something else? Okay, the American uh, with Disabilities Act uh, self-evaluation and transition plan update and the creation of the ADA advisory group. And Mr. Risky, you wanted to speak to this item? So, um, Mr. Um, uh, Director Gaynor, we're going to take citizens' comments first. Janad Risky, I'll speak to this item. Um, unfortunately, this is another unfortunate waste of money. And the reason why is the city recently moved ECTV, the television station, to the second floor of the service building. I believe those responsible at the city knew full well they were in violation of the ADA and the civil rights of disabled citizens when they moved this station to the second floor. This was not a grandfathered use, but a creation of a new use. 
There is no access to the second floor of the service building other than a service elevator, which is illegal to use, and a going up a ramp, driving, not a, not a disabled ramp, but a, a car ramp. The city highlights this in the report and admits there is no access if you look at the spreadsheet in the report on the last few, few pages of the report. So the city knows full well there's a problem. But what's troubling here was this was not a mistake, but a deliber deliberate act. Again, the city, the problem is the city claims it's going to f save money on it, it was going to save money on this move of $80,000 a year. Um, the city's claim really is not correct. And basically, the city wants to correct this in 2015 at a cost of $150,000, which I believe is, is not even close to what it's going to cost to fix this. Um, there are no cost savings here, but really what I, what's troubling here is the, the length of time to correct this problem and really deny access to disabled residents in this community to the television station. Someone basically said to me, well, I don't, don't know why people, you know, use a public, why would anybody use a public television station? Well, and I'm not an expert on the public television station. I was there a few times. But there are all types of people using that station and doing, we're doing programming. So unless we're changing what we're doing here, Every resident in this community has a right to that station, and you've violated their rights. And as, as far as I'm concerned, you'd have to really think of yourself, really, as the, you, the council members really are responsible for this, and you really need to take responsibility and ask some questions here why this was done this way. And there, this is, uh, there's a systemic problem here of how things are done in the city like this. Because nobody, this process wasn't a public process. This was a hidden process. Nobody, sh there's no documents to show any planning was done to move them over there. The, the other question is the building department. Why did it approve this? Basically, it's a problem. You shouldn't have approved it. So what's that say about your building department in the city of Evanston? And really, finally, you, you can think about yourselves. If you think about it in the South, white people deny black people really the opportunity to use public facilities. So you're, you're really acting no better that you're basically saying someone in a wheelchair has no right to use the television station. That's what you're doing here. So you need to think about that. Think about what's going on here. Thank you. I do have another topic, but I'll, I guess it's another open topic. So I will speak on another item later. Okay. Um, Mr. Gaynor. Um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, you have before you a recommendation uh, and a report uh, regarding our ADA um, uh, status. As you recall, the position of uh, uh, was eliminated, and we took steps to um, fill the gaps that were created by that elimination. Um, there are three uh, individuals who now are responsible for the three portions as we have uh, broken up our ADA, ADA responsibilities. First is a program portion, and Myra Gorman, who's been our inclusion specialist and very uh, much uh, uh, informed on ADA issues as it relates to um, the, the programmatic portions of, of um, our ADA requirements. Second is the uh, infrastructure, and we have an, uh, an architect on board who has been our expert for a number of years for infrastructure issues as uh, as it relates to ADA in particular. And third, if there is a, a legal issue, of course, it would go to um, our chief counsel, uh, Grant Farrar. The report in front of you uh, outlines that we have completed uh, a regulatory uh, requirement, which is the um, self-evaluation and a transition plan. It talks about a number of deficiencies that the city has. I want to point out, uh, as far as ADA uh, is concerned, but when the ADA laws were uh, passed, uh, it was very um, evident to the, the government, uh, to Congress, that this was not going to happen overnight. Change was not going to occur overnight. So there's language that says there needs to be, on an annual basis, an attempt to comply with ADA. And the city has done that over the last several years. If you recall, in our uh, capital improvement budget, there have been improvements to ADA, uh, to the ADA uh, requirements within a number of our facilities. 
A uh, perfect example is uh, currently we are going to be doing uh, restoration, renovation to two restrooms here in our facilities at the Civic Center. We're going to make two restrooms uh, compliant with ADA. There are a number of restrooms that are not, and it's our intent on an annual basis to complete uh, as many projects as our resources um, are available. So that's just uh, two examples of what we're doing. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'll be uh, uh, sending uh, to the city manager uh, tomorrow a request for his approval for uh, approximately a $17,000 improvement where we're going to make the uh, doors to the health department ADA compliant and redo the doors that most of you use. Uh, now we're going to redo those doors and we got an, an extremely uh, a great price to do both of those projects for I believe it was under uh, I think eighteen thousand dollars. So that'll give us uh, two ADA uh, entrances in the rear here, where most of the access to City Hall occurs. Uh, so we are moving forward, and again, it's based on the resources that we have available to us. So we have identified in this spreadsheet. Uh, a number of projects that need to be done and we will be working toward those. In addition, we have uh, uh, recommended that an, ID, an, an advisory group be uh, appointed that would help us uh, determine priorities for ADA infrastructure as well as uh, other issues that folks have who have disabilities. There's a number of positions uh, that we've asked for from to serve Human Relations Committee, the Parks and Recreation Board, and it's, and it's pretty well outlined here, as well as four members from the community who we would uh, specifically uh, hope that some of these folks would have disabilities so that they can assist us um, in um, addressing all of the ADA issues. So that's a brief overview of the report that you have. And I'd uh, be happy to answer any questions. I would you know, point out in the rear of the room is Myra Gorman, and she's the individual who works on our inclusion program for uh, our program, recreation program for those with disabilities, and has taken on the responsibility uh, for programmatic for ADA. Pro okay. Alderman Grover. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Gator. I move uh, acceptance of our ADA uh, program for the city been moved in second I just have one question um, the the new doors in the back for the health department and the south east entry I guess yeah. no southwest it is um, that's instead of doing something in the front now right is that no it's not so we're still going to do something in the front we're going to uh, continue to uh, review what our requirements are. I know that um, there's been a great deal of discussion amongst the council members and we tabled or at least we uh, held that item for a period of time. Um, but I know that in the last month uh, there have been three individuals who have used public transportation come to the door that we were going to uh, convert and we had to tell them they had to go around to the rear of the building. The law does say that if it you have to have, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, access where there is public transportation, and the public transportation is certainly on Ridge. Ridge Avenue. So we're going to continue to evaluate that. We're going to work with the law department, and we'll bring that back uh, at a further date, hopefully sometime latter part of September. Okay. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I have a question. I don't know if it's for you, Mr. Gaynor, or it's for the city manager. In terms of the um, television studio, um, if we had not found a place for them, would they just not be homeless by now? 
Because were they not? My sense is that there would no longer be public access television in Evanston. Well, that's what I thought. So, I mean, I understand that we may not have done it the way that, you know, people would like, but. And, and all these items were brought before the council. The move was brought before the council. Uh, all these things were publicly discussed. And uh, anyone who needs access to that facility will have access to that facility. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure because I, I was under the impression that they were didn't have anywhere to go and we just were trying to make sure that we continue to have the access and, and you know if I may Alderman Holmes members of the committee uh, this has been discussed on several occasions mm -hmm. um, public access television has been an important part of Evanston for a long time and the City Council has uh, challenged your staff to come up with a solution um, and we were able to find a, a location in the city uh, for no rent to allow the Evanston Community Media Center to continue to operate um, and uh, it's difficult when members of the community continue to to criticize and, uh, and question these public actions that the city council has made in order to allow the residents of Evanston to have free speech. And so I really want to commend once again the city council uh, for being as proactive as you have. Uh, ECMC has not been able to find support other places. Uh, this council has had to make cuts. There are communities all over America that have lost their public access television. But this city council has said repeatedly that it is a value of this community. And uh, I think it's important for the larger community to understand um, that most communities have lost the service, but the City Council has been creative in order to maintain it and will continue to partner with ECMC to make sure the residents of Evanston have something that residents and other communities all around us, residents and communities all over America have lost because of difficult budget times. But this City Council has made it a priority, was creative in order to allow them to move to uh, facilities that were rent free. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Risky, you had another item you wanted to address. Said though is, is is still not doesn't really deal with the issue because if you're denying people their access, it's still not justifying it. I'm sorry to say, um, and I'm, I am concerned, and I, I may take this to the next level, which I sort of warned city staff about, and that's going to the justice department, and that may be the end of the television station. But um, we may, you know, if if some people don't have access, then nobody should have access. So we ha we'll have to decide where we go with this. But I will speak on another matter. Um, um, one other item that's become, I, I recently noticed on a local website that gave me some concern. Um, is someone was suggesting that basketball hoops have been removed from um, parks in the south end of town and from the schools. And uh, I realized there is, as I drove down um, some of the streets here, I noticed at Cayman Park, which is a Ridgeville Park, I noticed hoops removed. I noticed that shoot school hoops were removed. But I would like to know, has the city removed basketball hoops from any city parks here? And, uh, and why, you know, has anybody, and what, what is the process of the removal of these hoops? Because we pay a lot of money as taxpayers to have parks, and when we have people just removing basketball hoops, um, and who's ever done this, I'd like to know why. And I mean, is, is there a process here at all? And does, how many hoops are removed? I mean, are, now, do we have areas of the community where we have basically very few basketball hoops because they've all been removed? I mean, I can't, I can't go do a survey, but I think something, this, the Parks and Recreation ought to know what's going on here. I think this council ought to address this because there's, the, there's we're talking, you know, we're, we're going to spend money on Oakton to open up this center for kids, you know, basically affluent kids in the community, and now we, we're, we're taking all the, the kids that were using the parks for free, if we're taking all the hoops away, what's going on here? I think it needs to be addressed. Um, Mr. Risky, if I remember correctly, and I may be wrong, but I, those, the complaint that came on the evening that the citizens came and talked about it, those were all Ridgeville parks, which we, as you know, we have no jurisdiction over. And I have not heard of a complaint in any of our parks. I don't really know. But I certainly would make a reference that we asked uh, Parks and Rec to let us know if we have that issue. But I haven't, 
I haven't received any complaints in my area. I don't know about any other alderman uh, about hoops being removed. Well, you're not the south uh, end of town. Of well, I'm not the south end of town. You're absolutely I correct. Don't so I don't know if it's just in the south end and if it's just Ridgeville Parks. I have no idea, but we can certainly ask Mr. Gaynor if we could have that kind of information and we can get that I think we should. You. I mean, because like I say, I just drove down Ridge. Mm -hmm. I saw it at Cayman Park, which is Ridgeville. It's gone. I saw Shoot School, which is gone. And I believe it even at Oakton, they're gone. I don't know about the city parks because I didn't see it. I can't. I can drive around and start looking. Well, no, we can ask. I mean, I'm sure that our staff should be able to ask those questions. And and as far as the school districts are concerned, um, that would be both District 65 for Chute and Oakton, and we could ask the school districts if they, you know, could give you that information. Again, we have no jurisdiction over them either. I don't think we do. I think okay. the question that should be asked, so if we have an area of town now that's, you know, there's, if we have, don't have enough city parks and we, the people were using those as places of recreation and now they're gone, so what do we have? So, you know, mm -hmm. for your kids. So I Thank you. Uh, communications. Um, Director Lyons, I believe you have communications for us. Yes, good evening. At the last meeting, Alderman Grover asked uh, me to provide the bi uh, biographical sketches of our EPL board members, and so through the chair, I've provided that this evening. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there anything else? If not, that concludes our agenda, and could we have a motion for adjournment? Move to adjourn. Second. It's been moved and second. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>